The Iron Game Chalk Talk Podcast is brought to you by the following sponsors. EliteForum.com and IgnitionAPG.com. And now, the Iron Game Chalk Talk Podcast. Welcome to Iron Game Chalk Talk with your host, Ron McKeefrey. Every time our athletes walk into this weight room, they're going to be pushed to the max. Let's go! Let's go! Everything you got! On this podcast, hear Coach McKeefrey straight talk about training, featuring the top strength and conditioning professionals from around the world. And now, here's your host, Ron McKeefrey. Hey guys, welcome back to Iron Game Chalk Talk. I'm your host, Ron McKeefrey, and this is episode number 54. Iron Game Chalk Talk is a weekly podcast where I bring you experts in the field each week to talk shop. If you haven't already done so, make sure you subscribe to us on iTunes, YouTube, or join the mailing list at ronmckeefrey.com so that you get updates each week on the latest guests as well as anything else that we have going on. This week, very excited to have Nick Tuminello on our show. I met Nick uh, several years ago when we both spoke at a uh, Smarter Team Training Conference up in Baltimore, uh, you know, hung out the whole night and, and uh, you know, just talk shop and watched him present. And, and he's a dynamic speaker, speaks around the world. He's an author, uh, puts out several DVDs and products. And, and, and then obviously he's a strength coach, personal trainer that works with some of the some of the elite bodybuilders and MMA fighters and um, different athletes from around the world. We talk a little bit about uh, his philosophy and, 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 and some of the, the mentors that he's had and helped shape that. Uh, you know, we get into uh, presentation skills, which I think is really cool. Uh, like I said, he speaks all over the place. And so uh, he really shares some great insight onto how to get into speaking and being confident doing it, as well as, you know, he just wrote, uh, strength training for fat loss and uh, you know I dive into a little bit of that with him as far as how you know how he went from concept to completion uh, for a book and getting it published and all those types of things so you know it's really kind of an outside the box presentation or, or episode but I think that you're really truly going to enjoy it um, so before we get going I want to make sure we recognize our sponsors ignitionapg.com and eliteform.com Elite Form is a sports science company based in Nebraska, and you've probably seen their, their booth at the different uh, strength conditioning conferences, but it is cutting-edge technology, and uh, they're doing some really, really neat things, you know, between their strength tracker, uh, their paperless system, and um, the strength planner. If you have not checked it out, you know, make sure you go to their Facebook page. It's facebook.com backslash elite form sports science. And, uh, you know, just follow along some of, the, some of the really cool things that people are doing out there using their technology and uh, really advancing uh, the profession, I believe. I, I think they're, they're really doing some, uh, some innovative things. If you'd like to try their, uh, their strength planner, Make sure to, to email IGCT at EliteForm.com, and they'll send you a free 30-day trial. And I'm telling you, it's, it's a time saver. And in our profession, it is one of those things that it, we just don't have enough time. And it's more time with our families and more time doing some our hobbies and different things along those lines. But I um, really think that you would enjoy it. Lastly, if you enjoy our podcast, you will definitely enjoy strength-ondemand.com. Strength on Demand is an online archive of strength leadership clinic presentations that Rob Taylor and myself have put together along with several other coaches from around the world uh, that have contributed. And it's really just a, a great way to be able to sit back on your own time and listen and sharpen the sword with various strength leadership topics and presentations. And so... Um, really think that you would enjoy it. It's something that, you know, like I said, we created for ourselves more so than anything and just our way of kind of trying to give back to the profession. So check that out, strength-ondemand.com. And uh, I, I, like I said, I think you're really going to find it useful. All right, want to get to Nick. I think it's going to be a great episode for you. And uh, you know, sit back, take lots of notes, and we'll talk to you on the other side. 
All right, guys, excited to have Nick Tuminella with us. Nick is a buddy of mine that we met, God, how long ago was it? Probably five, six years ago at a conference. Yeah, at least. We spoke yeah. at and, and uh, Rob Taylor's conference, I think, and, mm -hmm. you know, stayed friends ever since and, and uh, been is a fantastic resource for me online and the stuff that he puts out and writes about and speaks about. So I wanted to have him on the show for everybody. So, Nick, appreciate you coming on it, man. Hey, I really appreciate you having me, bro. It's an honor, and uh, thanks for getting the opportunity to share some of my experiences and learn from you as well. Down in sunny Florida right now, where everybody else is cold and wet and rainy, and you get to be down in the sun, so it's not fair. But, hey, Nick, go, kind of go into a little bit your story, man. How did you get in? I know we don't want to spend too much time on this, but, you know, because you're a shooter. Anybody can Google you and find a thousand things. But, you know, how did you get into this field, and, and you know, how did you get to your current spot? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll just give you the Reader's Digest version. First off, I'm not a, a college guy. I don't have any degrees. I did not go to college for this. I'm just a high school guy. I was a C student all through high school. Um, I actually hated school. I've never liked authority, which is why I never did well with uh, <laughs> never did well with, with, with the school setting. But I had no problem learning on my own. I've always known I wanted to get into this field. It always just felt like a hobby of mine, and I always had a desire to really take things to the next level. Um, so kind of just working backwards for a second, my mother was a bodybuilder in the early 80s. Back then they looked more like what you would call a figure girl right now. I used to go to the gym with her um, instead of going to a babysitter. Um, that's not a joke. I literally grew up in a gym. Like, I literally did. Um, so I had that influence all sure. through, uh, you know, as an athlete, all through my childhood. My mother used to take me to fitness conferences when I was an early teenager. Uh, my mother was also a PA. She used to... Um, teach um, CPR courses. So when I was 12 years old, I was going three to three CPR courses a night that she was teaching. So I knew how to do all that stuff. So this came up, you know, I really came up with this. Um, it's really the only job I've ever known. I worked at about three gyms as a personal trainer at 16, 17 years old, got fired from all three of them um, because I was always trying to push the envelope in regards to going to conferences. Oh, no, you should do it this way. Oh, no, the research says this. And then nobody wanted to hear that from the 17 year old punk kid. Right. So I finally got hired at a gym uh, when I was 18, a well-known gym um, called the Maryland Athletic Club, the MAC, and uh, that was a great place to be. They had a great staff of people there, and I learned a lot, gained a lot of experience. By 20 years old, I was out, started my own uh, business. By 21, I took over ownership at the studio that I was training with, uh, with my business partner, Mark Spatero. I, I replaced his current business partner. And from then on, I had my own um, training facility, co-owned it with, with Mark. And um, I still have yet to this day, with all the travels I do, find a facility, a private training facility that works with the diversity, the regular, on a regular basis, the diversity of clients that we had. I, I mean, I had um, clients from uh, bodybuilders and figure girls to, of course, your bread and butter, which is the personal training, you know, the moms and dads and sure. the seniors. Um, but MMA fighters, um, football players of different levels, high school athletes, um, you know, you name it. So what we learned from there, just real quick little lesson, and then we'll move on yeah. from this, is that, you know, I, and this is one of the things I see different in the training realm is I think people are mistaking the tools of the trade. You know, I'm a kettlebell specialist. I'm a sandbag this. And all that's great. You, you, right. You're going to buy a specialty tool. You want to get the person who knows everything about it to teach it to you. But that doesn't mean you have to be the specialist. You just need to know everything about how to use that tool from a specialist who's selling you that tool. Um, but I think we're, we're, we're mistaking the tools of our trade for the trade itself. Kettlebell is not a trade. It is a tool of the trade. We're like carpenters. We have a full tool belt, and we need to know which tools to put away, when to take them out, how much to use it. And the dosage, we're exercise experts. So when you think of things that way, you know how to manipulate print the uh, what variables you need to manipulate and what principles you need to honor in order to get the individual their goal. So that's why we were able to work successfully with so many people because it was about the client and it was about getting them their goal. And we worked backwards from there, not fitting people into our system, which was an Olympic lifting system or a kettlebell system or a powerlifting system. No. We work for you. What is your goal? And then we will fit the training to that. No, that's a great point. You know, and, and you don't, you know, especially like you said, you're, you're, you're absolutely, this is what I love about you. You're comfortable in your skin, man. You know exactly who you are. You know what you know, and you know, and you know what you don't know. Sometimes that's even as, as important as a strength conditioning coach. 
you don't, you know, you don't not go to college. You don't not go get all those certifications and all those types of things, unless you have some great mentors along the way, who, who are some of the biggest influences? And then, you know, when you, when you were learning, because I mean, obviously you speak around the world on strength and conditioning, when you were learning all those things, how did, how did that learning process come about? Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the people that I, that inspired me, that's the biggest thing I can really use. It inspired me to get into this, and whether I agree with everything that they do or not, and some of them I don't even talk to talk up to anymore because relationships change, people change, and things like that. Sure. The first person that I saw that really rocked my world when I was about 16 years old or 17 was Paul Check. Now I'll be flat out. I, 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 some of a lot of the stuff that I see him doing nowadays, I look and I go, whoa, whoa. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's, it's very opposite of the how I would approach things now, right. 34 years old and teaching and all the things I do. But I think all of us in my generation, coming up in the late 90s, early 2000s, um, and 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 the next generation um, who's coming up right now, you know, the 25 year olds or whatever. Um, Owe him a big debt of gratitude. Also, J.C. Santana. Also, Michael Clark. Also, Mike Boyle. Um, you know, all those people certainly inspired me. I learned lots of them, lots of things from them. But you know, the industry moves on, and um, some people don't move on with it. You know, so things change, and um, we just try to learn from the uh, the lessons that we got, and we also try to learn from the mistakes that we see some of our mentors making, you know? Right. So uh, other influences, Bruce Lee was a big influence for me, just reading his philosophies and, and taking that, that mixed approach, you know, saying, hey, look, if karate does everything, then why were other martial arts developed? Uh, if powerlifting does everything, then why were other forms of training developed? That's a great it, point. The things uh, that, um, that he talked about apply in martial arts and philosophy apply perfect to training, and it's a shame what he talked about in the 60s in martial arts still doesn't seem to be getting translated when it so obviously applies to to, to fitness training. Um, and also my mother, you know. Uh, I mean, I had great parents. I don't want to leave my dad out of it and not give him credit, but my dad wasn't a fitness guy. You right. know, dad was an engineer. So um, my mother's a big influence in, in fitness. For sure. well, did you go out and seek those people out? Did you? I mean, was it? I'm sure it was a combination of going to clinics and speaking people out and reading books and things along those lines. What was probably the single best learning uh, opportunity you had? was it? Where did you get most of your education, I would say? Well, I'll, I'll say this. Um, I, can't, I can't narrow it down to a single best type thing. And um, I, I did not save, and I spent all my extra money on my education. I mean, aside from, you know, buying DVDs I wanted and CDs and, you know, shit like that. But, I mean, I, I no joke, from the time I was... 17 or 18, about 18, to the time I was probably 27, I did not, I spent all my extra income, and I mean all my extra income, I just had enough money to pay my bills and, you know, go to one vacation when I wanted to, on DVDs, books, um, attending conferences, I was a, a conference junkie, yeah. because I was just determined to learn as much as I could from as many people as I could, but I always followed the motto, I didn't make this motto up, um, you know, listen to everyone, believe no one, meaning believe them blindly, you know, but, you know, I always checked facts, and I always looked at the differences, okay, well, how come this person says this, but this person says this, these are mutually incompatible, what's going on here, which is really create a lot of the influence that, you know, me kind of being known as a critical thinker and, and pushing that into the industry, which is wonderful because it's actually starting a movement, um, which is a much needed movement um, to relieve a lot of confusion and, and build more powerful um, consumers, consumers of education, I mean. So, um, so I, yeah, I, I can't narrow it down. I would just say the biggest benefit, to give you the one thing, was really just the innate quality I, I have in myself that... I'm going to be the absolute best I can be at this. It's somewhat of a competitive nature with myself, and I won't bullshit you. It's competitive with everybody else too. I want to be better than you, I, you know. And but here's the thing: I also want to be a better teacher than other people. So because when you have when you help other people come up, 
that that winning is plural. Winning is not you me staying here and you staying below me and being afloat in Nick's parade. Me is being able to, to make this industry better than when I than when I left it. But I would love to be a, be more recognized than other people at doing that. So yeah, there's a little bit of selfishness sure. in there. But I'm not a selfish um, person. That's just my innate com- competitive nature in myself. And and I say that because I think there's uh, and I was going to write about this, but there are two things that people don't talk about when it comes to um, training and getting involved with writing and, and speaking and things. Um, and that's that's a, a talent. Um, you know, I can't sing. I can't play instruments. I don't learn other languages well. There's a lot of stuff I can't do. Right. Um, you know, uh, I, I but I have just an innate ability to do this, and this is what I think about it. And um, and I think a lot of people don't talk about that. Just some things you're more naturally predisposed to, and you and eventually you're hopefully what you do as a career or hobby lines up with what you're predisposed to. Like someone's more naturally predisposed to be a linebacker or a defensive player than an offensive player or something like that. Sure. So, and you're always going to be able to cultivate your strengths much easier and endlessly than you can cultivate your weaknesses. You know, if you suck at something, you can work for three years at it and maybe make this much progress. But if you're awesome at something and you work at it, it's the sky's the limit. No doubt. I agree agree with you a hundred percent. You know, one of the, one of the things I get asked quite a bit and, and, you know, I, I'd, I'd rather just pass that on to you because you're the master at it is, is, you know, getting into the speaking circles and the writing circles and things like that. I mean, um, it's something that you have to work at, you know, and you have to you have to become a better speaker and you have to become a better writer. And you have to work at those crafts, but it, even breaking in and, and it had to be hard for a 17 year old trainer to break into those circles as well. What are some of the recommendations you have for strength coaches that are that are wanting to write more, speak more and, and kind of put themselves out there that way? Yeah, yeah. Well, I didn't. Um, I my first ever speaking gig. I was 25 years old, but I'm not even going to count that because it was it was through a, a friend. It wasn't anything at a big conference. My first ever conference gig was right before I turned 30. Was at the Idea Personal Trainer, um, or, sorry, Fitness Fusion, which they which is now owned by a different company. Now they right. Idea has done something else with it. It was in Chicago. It was right before I turned 30 years old. So I, I wasn't you know speaking at 17. I had accumulated a lot of hours. Sure. There. So I, I'll, I'll but tell. There was groundwork oh, laid. There was groundwork. There, yeah, there was yeah, groundwork yeah. laid at so, that point. So um, I, I'll say I'll, I'll give you my progression in regards to how I became you know a trainer like everybody else to somebody who people kind of knew to speaking to okay yeah. and it is a long process. Um, the first thing I started doing was was writing um, articles and um, and the best way to do that is you you network with a guy like yourself or a guy like myself who already has the connections of the places that you want to be at. So let's say you want to write for bodybuilding.com uh, or T, T Nation, um, which is a great place to start writing, by the way. That's where I had my first article published. Um, and a, a lot of the magazines, like the editors of Men's Health and Men's Fitness, both read T Nation. So um, I know that for a fact. So um, to write for those websites, so what you do is Come up to someone like me at a conference. Be proactive, and um, and just say, "Hey, Nick, you know, I'd like to talk to you for a second. You know, I'm a, I'd really like to to write, and um, can I tell you about some ideas? Because everybody wants to be known, but you know, like everybody wants to be a famous musician. But how good are your songs, right? Right. So there's a saying, and I know this sounds very harsh, but it's but it's true. It's that's it's a tough love kind of thing. It says most everybody has a book within them, but for most people, that's where it should stay, right? You could say that about a song or anything else. I have probably a lot of songs in me, but they should stay there because I have no singing. <laughs> so what you do is you come to somebody like me. I went to Eric Cressy, and, um, and I sh- talked to Eric, met him, and I said, you know, I have this idea, actually a couple ideas for articles. Here's what I'm thinking. And when a guy like Eric, you know, who's been writing and reads and knows, goes, that's pretty cool, man. Like, you, you got an idea there. Okay. You know, and... and and at that point, I'm happy to give you my email. Heck, I'm happy to give you my damn phone number. You know why? Because I want to see your talent unleashed because I want to see this world, this training world, better than when I left it. And if I can help facilitate that, I'm becoming more of a person of value, right? And that's what we should seek to be. Not just success, but a person of value. And, um, 
and it's as simple as that. But the thing is, you got to have good ideas, right? Um, or at least a, a good way to communicate those ideas or take some an old idea and spin it in, in a slightly unique way, right? Um, there's a lot of talk about um, people, oh, just to be, especially the old school, you know, people. If just, people are just trying to be different just to be different. And you're just trying to be a contrarian. And all these things you hear, and I, and I, my question to them, to the people who think that way, is I go, what good am I doing for you if I just write about everything that you've already heard, already doing, and already know? Absolutely. I'm wasting your time at that point. I'm actually insulting your intelligence That's right. at that point. So what's the point? So there's got to be something, and it doesn't have to. You don't have to reinvent the wheel, but show them your brand of wheels. That's what I tell them. I'm giving you my brand of wheels, right? And maybe I uh, can organize things. Maybe you know it, but I organize it in a different way. Or maybe you do something that I know that you organize it, and I go, you know what? I like how he did that better. That's yeah. how we move forward. All right. So you start there, get published. Um, and then start your own blog. Nowadays, it's free, you know it's it's always been free. Nowadays, it's more important than ever. Reason being is that okay, someone reads your article, but what if they really like it? What do they do? You know, then they can find your name. They're going to Google search you, and then they got a website. So now this person can connect with you on a you know more personal and more regular level, right? So um, that's where that process starts, and you write more. You build your reputation up through there. The next step is start speaking at smaller gigs. And um, you reach out to those people. Do not sit back and wait for your email to blow up, That's right. or your phone to ring. Sorry, that does not happen until you, you know, until far along the road when you're just kind of so, so many places that, that, you know, people can't go anywhere without you. And it's almost bad for the media not to have you as part of that. That's a long time coming. Seek those people out. Like Rob Taylor is a great example. He's a local conference in the Maryland area and some other local ones um, in like the Georgia, Atlanta area and whatnot. Seek those people out. They're always looking to cultivate new presenters. And at least you have somewhat of a, an idea of how to communicate um, your thoughts. And actually speaking live is different than writing. But that's, that's the way to start. Absolutely. Well, you know, it, 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 and if I could add my two cents, I mean, it's it's really having a desire to want to do it. You know, that starts with that. And, and there's so many, I mean, I, you know, going to, to the CSCCA conference coming up here pretty quick, and you'd be amazed about how hard of a time they have finding speakers at the event of the year for a college strength and conditioning coach or the NSCA conferences where it's every strength and conditioning coach. And they have a hard time trying to find speakers that are willing to put themselves out there in a vulnerable type of setting. And that, and again, it kind of goes back to what I said earlier with you. You know exactly who you are. You know exactly what you know. And you know exactly what you don't know. And you're willing to put that out there. Right. And so many times you, you get criticized for that. Not you or just in general, all of us. Oh, I get criticized all the time. Yeah, but you know <laughs> what? That, you're exactly right. I mean, when, it, when, when, when the intent is pure, like I know it is with you, like I know it is with me and, and other strength coaches that are willing to do that, then it's it's – we all need to rally around those people and we need to encourage exactly what you're saying where we, we need to uplift everybody. What you said earlier, winning is plural. That's huge, man. That's, that's exactly what it is. And, and for us to take a, cause our, our, our field, our profession right now is in kind of a, a standstill a little bit. You know, we gotta, we gotta find a way to push it on just like the people that started and, and, and built our profession did in the first place. And, and uh, sure. I can't agree enough with what you're saying. Well, um, I'll say I'll, I'll piggyback off what you said. You actually brought up a, a, a point that's a, a must, and what what you're really saying is you know you have to have the the, the want to and the desire. So I'll, I'll say this, and I heard Thomas Plummer say this, and it was great, uh, and I completely agree. But I'm going to speak it from like I'm speaking for myself. The only thing that separates me when I'm up on stage, you know, from the people who aren't. Um, aside from maybe the fact that I've taken the time to organize my thoughts and maybe I have a more natural inclination for that is a, a lack of fear. You know, so what you really just said is a security. Um, and, but, but there's also another aspect to that want to, you have to be willing. I, I, so I was just talking to my very good friend, Brett Contreras, who a lot of people know, you know, the glute guy and, um, who's built a very, very popular following as well. What popular website we have some crowd crossover. I'm more geared towards fitness professionals and exercise enthusiasts 
he tends to also talk to a little bit more of the like the younger male lifter crowd. You know what I mean? The, the strength kind of crowd. Um, that's his niche. But we were just talking about you know how much thankless work you have to put in, not only in the beginning but but also throughout. Meaning, you you can't just you know cut your personal training or your strength coach hours in half, go home and, and sit on your ass and write because you're not making anything back from that. That's right. It takes at least, I would say at least a few years to build um, a reputation where people are looking at you as a reliable resource, right? There's, a, there's an old saying that says, like, you tell one joke and people say, that joke was funny. You tell lots of jokes, people say, you're funny, right? So... Those lots of jokes are lots of uh, good, high-quality work where people just associate what you do with high-quality stuff, and that takes a while, right? So, um, and you have to do that on your own for free, all the things. So you have to want to do that. Um, sure, there could be career benefits in it as well, and I'll tell you, nobody's getting rich out of that. I can promise you that. Um, but you also want to do it because you have that innate desire, like I keep going back to, whether it's an internal competitiveness, external competitiveness, you want to help the industry, all of the, I have all of those above. <laughs> right, right. And, and that's what drives me to, to do this and keep doing it. You know, one of, the, one of the challenges I have, and I'm sure you faced this early on too, is you have tons of knowledge. And just like you, you have tons of knowledge. And um, I'm reading a you know, I read a book by Chip and Dan Heath called Made to Stick, you right. know, and they, and they talk about the curse of knowledge, you know, and, and how, you know, sometimes it's so hard. And I, I sit there and I look at some of these articles and, and you know, um, like you just did an article not too long ago on, uh, I think, band pull-ups or something, right? Right. You yeah. know, and I'm sitting there and I'm like, man, that's a, that's a great idea. It's a great article. But, you know, for me to sit back and think, okay, how do I break down the band pull-up? I'm, I'm sitting there going, if you ask me, I can tell you. But to think of that idea in the first place, right. it's, extremely, it's a talent, you know. And so how do, you, how do you cultivate that talent? So that's a great, that's a great question. And, and I, I'll, I'll just say this to you before I – it'll make more sense to say this. You know as an experienced coach, and this is to me one of the things that tends to go by the wayside when you hear these people go, oh, so-and-so is just a writer. Or they don't train. Oh, that stuff. We, we can get into that. But um, – it, anybody who's an experienced personal trainer, coach, whatever, you can immediately look at something and because you're looking at it with the few the, through the filter of a very experienced person and know if that's an applicable thing or not. Yeah. You know, you, you surely know that. So you know if it's coming from a point of, of impracticality just to be unique, just to be unique, or it's actually something that would fit in a certain setting, right? So because you've been in those different settings, I can tell you what works – in home and not in gym, and both in home and gym, because I've done all those many times over. You have defaults when you have experiences like that. So that being said, all I'm doing with those articles is sharing all of the solutions and approaches I took when I was training full-time 10, 12 hours a day, right? Do I still train people? Yes. Do I train uh, very part-time? Yes, because this is my main focus now, training trainers. I paid my dues, man. Like I said, I started training when I was 17, 18, had a gym when I was 21 years old. I did it for 10 years. So, you know, I joke. I remember reading an article in 2005, I remember the year, um, by Mike Boyle saying, um, you know, oh, apologizing to personal trainers because he had just started doing more personal training and how different it was than training, you know, the sports performance realm because it's more customer service driven. And I remember thinking, so... In 2001, I was 21, so in 2005, I was 25. And, you know, so you got to think about that. I'd already had my gym for five years at that point, right? right. Um, and I'm thinking, wow, like it was a realization for me that here's a guy who has been in this game, in the fitness and con the training and conditioning game for, you know, since I was a child. But when it comes to the personal training aspect of that, which is different than rehab and sports performance, as you know, because it's, it's very customer service driven, um, I, I can run this guy in circles because this is my world. This is what I do. I've been, I've, I'm way past the 10,000 hour mark and he's just getting started and he's just realizing the differences here. And that was another key thing for me to start teaching and focusing on 
the, tr the fitness training realm because I also saw, I started to see that a lot of trainers were gravitating towards uh, performance coaches and physical therapists and we were starting to lose that, um, that, that difference of the arena that we're in, that the individuals right. that we're dealing with. No, that's great. That's a great point. Well, I want to, I want to switch topics a little bit. I want to talk a little bit, you know, you just had, a, you just wrote a book, strength training uh, for weight loss. And you know, it's, it's a it's common, yeah. it's, a, it's a common challenge as a, as a college strength and conditioning coach, pro strength and conditioning coach to deal with those, what we call high needs athletes, you know, the weight gain athletes or the weight loss athletes, you know, and, and you got the, you got the bell shaped curve, you know, you got the, those are one end of the, the perspective. And then in the middle, you got pretty much everybody else, you know, that just needs right. to strength train and, and, and eat, and you know, eat food basically. But right. what are some recommendations, you know, after doing the research for this book and, and, you know, putting all the time and hours into your personal experiences, what are some recommendations you have for that 340 pound lineman that you need to get down to 300 pounds? Sure. Um, that, that's an awesome question, brother. So I, I hammer this home, and the book's called Strength Training for Fat Loss. So I make that specific, not Strength Training for Weight Loss. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, that's okay. I just want to make sure. They're easy to make. I just, just in case somebody wants to look it up, I just want yeah, to Yeah, no, we'll, we'll link it up below, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Strength Training for Fat Loss. So um, the thing is, you, you, have to, you have to watch what goes in your mouth. The, the research is conclusive. This is not up for debate by you know, gurus who have their things. It's calories in versus calories out. You have to be in a caloric deficit if you want to lose fat, all right? Plain and simple. Um, so, you know, and the research has looked at different macronutrient divisions, you know, high protein, or, I mean, less carb or with higher carb, and they all balance out the same with weight low fat loss as long as the, there's a, a caloric deficit, all right? So the easiest way to create the caloric deficit is just don't eat as much food. Sure, you could say, well, I can burn 500 calories by spending an hour on the elliptical trainer. Or you can not eat the bagel and save yourself all the pounding on your knees, especially when you're a football player who's 350 pounds, right. and every step you take is beating the crap out of your knees, all right? And you're worth $8 million a year or whatever. So um, where does the strength training component come in? We want to do that in order to... Minimize muscle loss and maintain muscle, which we have research that shows that that, that can be done. Um, and also, because it's safer on your, on your body, you're not pounding yourself by doing endless bouts of cardio. Plus, it has more carryover in regard from a performance standpoint to what you're doing, right? right. As opposed to just be trying to train like an endurance athlete. So that really, to summarize the book, um, the, the book is... is written for the general consumer, but um, it's very obvious when you look at the book that it's not geared towards the obese population who's just off the couch looking to start something. It is geared towards the, what I always say is, what if you're already eating okay and already exercising and you're kind of in that realm, right? You're, you're already right. eating and training like a football player, so you need to lose weight and lose fat. What do you do now? That's who it's geared towards. So it's geared towards someone with a training base. Um, although I do have some beginner programs in there just for people who are looking to kind of get back into it. But it's certainly not geared towards the, um, you know, the beginner person who's you know, an obese person off the couch and hasn't stepped in a gym or picked up a dumbbell in, in five years plus. Um, and that's in interesting because we've almost created a, a, a niche where it's almost like we have this high level of fitness and beginner stuff. And the, the niche is really right in the middle because we've, right. we've pushed things further and further um, apart. So, and the reason why I say that is because the only difference between conditioning, which is really what we're talking about with a football player, and I say this in the book, and a fat loss isn't the workout because there's no such thing as fat loss exercises. Right. Like there's no difference between men exercise and women. There's exercises. Is the diet. I can get you in, I can increase your work capacity, which is, you could call it metabolic training, power endurance, whatever trendy term you want to put in there. Um by beating you up with, with certain protocols, right? right? High intensity, total body, repetitive effort type work. But if I want to make that fat loss, then I have to add a diet component with it because I've got to put you in a caloric deficit. Sure, training burns calories, but we know that strength training doesn't burn the amount of calories that cardio training does. Right. So that's the gap that a lot of people say, oh yeah, well cardio is shown to burn more um, fat. That's because it burns more calories. But if you just don't eat the bagel, you're already in the caloric deficit. Now, what are you going to do to keep the muscle? 
Right. That right. that's the right. issue. Well, that's that's absolutely the biggest challenge, and that's why you know most of our, you know, with our with our fat loss guys or the you know the guys that we're trying to get down. You're right. I mean, uh, you know, going out and running, you know, two miles might take them quite a long time, and and it is a lot of of stress on the joints for a guy that weighs 350 pounds versus. What we tend to do is on you know Wednesdays and Saturdays we'll bring them in and we'll do a kettlebell circuit or something along those lines to to add some resistance to elevate the intensity which is really I think what, what the value of strength training for fat loss is exactly. and um, and then turn around and get some range of motion and some things like that out of out of a load you know and, and uh, I think that's a, a fantastic concept that you talk a little bit about. Um, you know, that process, because I think that's another thing that strength coaches are really interested in is, you know, I got this idea in a book. I just read uh, Jeff Connors, uh, strength coach, uh, A Call to Serve. You know, it's a, a strength coach writing a book, which, again, we got to do more of as a profession if we want to continue to grow it. You had that idea in your head. What, what were the steps that you took to try to put that down on paper and then hold yourself accountable to getting that out to being published and, and, and into Amazon or, or, you know, Barnes and Nobles or whatever? Sure. Well, yeah, the publisher, Human Kinetics, is my publisher. They they take care of that stuff, which is which is great. But sure, surely someone can do a self-published book and get it on Amazon and and whatnot. Um, that's a great question. I would say it's it definitely starts with writing a lot of articles and blogs, and you get better at you know organizing your thoughts, putting them out there in a concise format, and you also have to decide what audience are you talking to. Or am I going to talk to people like you? Am I going to talk to the consumer? If you want to, you know, and that's going to take a lot of time. Your always best bet is to go to the consumer. Trainers will buy consumer stuff, mm-hmm. but consumers won't buy trainer stuff. You understand? Right. Yep. So it's always good. You've got to be able to simplify it as much as possible. That way the general consumer can understand and use it, but the trainer can certainly observe and appreciate the, the, the uh, principle-based elements that were put into it. All right? So that you can make it apply to everybody. Um. The, that was tough for me, dude, because when you write articles, it's like that. It's like a workout. You have that instant gratification. You know, you, you see it from start to finish, an hour, you, oh, man, that was great. You know, you high five and everybody. This is like this long out process. So the way I did it, what worked best for me, is to write it basically in mini articles. You see, so I'd take a chapter and I would first say, what do, and this is, a, this is the best tip I can give anybody for writing anything, blog, article, or book is in each chapter, look at, a, look at a book chapter as in a series of articles or one long article, however you want to look at that. What, write first, what do you want the reader to learn from it? Right? What do you want the person to take away? What is their benefit? What are their lessons? And then you, re, you reverse engineer and get to that point in as little nonsense, fluff and puff as possible. <laughs> That's it, right? And this really, really simple formula. You answer the the who, what, where, how, why, right? You know, who needs to do this? That would be really the beginning of the book, all right? So um, why? what is it? What are you talking about? Why is it important? How do you do it? That's it, you know, and when to use it if that's a factor. Do you want people to train at a certain time of day or, you know, how do you want to divide their workouts up? You know, that's obviously specific to the subject matter. Um, you cover those bases. It's very, very easy to do. Um, and then what you want to do is think about um, answering all the questions before they're asked. Okay, so if I read this, what questions might somebody ask me about this? And it's, uh, it's always better, especially in a consumer book, to try to over-communicate than under-communicate. It doesn't mean overwrite. It just means, for, let me give you a great example. I have lots of exercises in the book. Not one exercise did I write how wide to put your feet, right? Because, you know, I don't think about that. I just, you know, when I'm training, I very rarely, I just, I'll just tell people, you know, I'll spread your feet a little wider or whatever. But I'm not, I never think when I'm coaching, right. oh, put your feet at shoulder width apart. Put your feet together. I, you know, I don't say that. But my editor was like, you, you know, the, the reader doesn't, doesn't know this. And I was like, oh, holy crap, I've never, never even thought about that. Because right. you're thinking from your perspective, not... The, the person who's never seen some of these so, exercises. Yeah, sure. So just little things like that is what I mean. Um, but get to the point as fast as possible is another thing. You know, no rants, no, no fluff and puff. Um, 
that that stuff just just contaminates the message. Yeah. How long how long of a process was that for you? From the time that I got my contract that we just, that I talked with Human Kinetics and we decided on the, the topic and I got the contract in the mail to the time that I first had the book in my hand was was pretty much three years. Wow. Um, but that's not that's not to say that the book took me three years to write. Um, the book took me about a year to write, you know, in between doing everything else I'm doing. Um, but for them to put a copy editor on it was like five months because they had copy editors working on other book projects. So from right. the time I first finished my first draft, it was like five months until we even I even worked with an editor. And then they use a photographer because their photographer is a specific brand. They take pictures a certain way, and they want that the same. That was four months, four or five months to get set up where we were both in town, just get the location. So that's a year burned right, right there. Right, right. Well, that makes sense. No, that's, that's awesome, man. I think a lot of strength coaches have, like you said, have a book in them, and a lot of them have great things to say that, that should come out. It's just a matter of getting that out on paper and, 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 and having no fear and, and putting yourself out there that way. So I appreciate you sharing that. We, yeah. You know, Nick, we always kind of finish these things off with um, – some resources here, you know, give us, give us a quote that you live by or, or one that you got plastered up in your weight room or something that, uh, that you use with your athletes or your clients. You know, I, it's funny you say that. I, I can't, I, well, I, I don't have a gym anymore down here in South Florida. I'm right. just back to for training part time as independent. And, but I did have a gym for a long time and we never had any of those big quotes up there. Um, maybe it's just the environment we cultivated wasn't really into that kind of stuff, but I certainly had quotes that I, you know, leave in and whatnot. So my adaption, <laughs> I'm just going to speak from a, a trainer to other trainers or trainer to other coaches in regards to learning because I see so much confusion. The biggest thing that I still hear is, I don't know what to do. There's so much conflicting information. So really this, this quote is in reaction to that. What I would say is, you know, stick your head into everybody's information, books, DVDs, whatever, but never stick your head up anybody's ass. So, <laughs> and, and, and that just, that just means that, you know, you, you, you have to understand that we're all human, we're all fallible, we can all be wrong, um, and just think about how could you be wrong, what other, how could I be wrong, you know, turn it on yourself, uh, and, and think about things, did I learn, why do I know this, do I know this for a good reason, or is it just because we've always done it, or just because my old, you know, coach taught that to me, is that a good reason? When we start evaluating ourselves more that way, we start to really... Um, become more inquisitive, less closed-minded, and, and you start to really pursue truth at that at that point. Um, and you start to find that you are better at filtering information and noticing what are good reasons and not so good reasons for doing what you're doing. And um, you know, and you can believe things for bad reasons. It's just maybe you don't have as much. You don't throw them in people's faces as if they're you know definite facts. You will, you're right. much more humble and you say, well, I could be wrong about this, but I found this. And you start to know how to weigh your intensity of your beliefs relative to the width of the evidence that supports them. And maybe it's just experience. That's cool. But they're all relative. No, I agree. I agree. Give us, uh, you know, and I know, you know, most of your learning, I would imagine is the same as mine now where, you know, when you put yourself out there doing a, a podcast or speaking or writing and things along those lines, you all of a sudden you get flooded with opportunities to learn. And uh, I think that's, you know, uh, going to the other, these other conferences and speaking, I get the I get the opportunity to sit down and listen to the other presenters speak and, sure. and learn. But, you know, when you're when you're when you're reading, uh, you're surfing the web or things like that. What is a, What's a book uh, and maybe an app that you use and, and a website recommendation for the coaches to, to check out? Oh, well, I, I, I'm happily, it, I got the, the first three that pop into my head in regards to just websites and people to check out, that they're just good resources, uh, are Brad Schoenfeld, who just wrote the book, The Max Muscle Plan, but, you know, check out his blog, it's workout911.com, and I think lookbetternaked.com, too, I think that's his, uh, both websites, take you to the same place, Brad Schoenfeld, um, Brett Contreras, um, and Alan Aragon. Um, no, yeah. You know, there's lots of other great people out there. I could sit here and you know keep naming people and whatnot, but I would just say, you know, they're they're part of the new the new guard that is is um, less dogmatic, more interested in a combination of um, research founded but 
application driven, you know, not just science nerds. Right, right. Um, although they, they, they often get coined that way, but that's just simply not true. Um, their work speaks for itself. But just who I would consider high confidence values and also good, good people. Yeah. You know, smart people in the fitness industry are, are like are like girls, beautiful women. They're, they're a dime a dozen. But what do you got up here? What's attached to it? What's the personality? What you know? Yeah. How do you deliver that information? And um, that's to me is another filter there. And those they're they're just good people. Well, we'll link you know your book and a couple of your other books up as well. But what what is a what's the latest book that you read that you felt like what contributed to your your success? Um, my favorite book that I've read recently is a book called Think. Here, I'll show you. I actually got it right behind the computer right here. Um, probably my favorite skeptical, I don't know if you guys can see, Think, mm -hmm. right? Why You Should Question Everything. To me, by Guy P. Harrison, which is one of my favorite skeptical authors, um, what I like about his books is he's very conversational. Um, he doesn't, you know, he's not aggressive. He's not overly assertive. He doesn't make you feel like, you know, I mean, you're – you're a dumbass because you believe this or you don't do this or, or whatever. And I think a lot of – sometimes us coaches, we some of us, we tend to get like that as well. And that's fine. People can be that way. I, just not how I approach things, so which is why I resonate with his stuff. But, you know, the reason why I recommend that book as opposed to a training book is because we are in the information age. And the, the key now is, you know, how are you looking at information? What's more reliable? Because not all information is equal and just because – people have different opinions doesn't mean that both opinions are equal, right? Absolutely. So we have to learn how to evaluate which things are more likely to be true, which things we can put more confidence in. Um, and it's things like that I think are needed more than ever in the fitness industry because of where we are at in regards to there's so much information um, out there. You know, how to be able to separate, pick out the people like yourself from – you know, the 20-year-old guy who may just be trying to do things because he's just trying to make a name for himself and be different. Yeah. If you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't, you, you give equal time and now you're just confused. So no, there's got to evaluate information. No, I agree 100%. Well, Nick, you're, you're, you're pretty much everywhere on the web, but, you know, and we'll link up your website and, and your social media and whatnot, but is there anything you got going on coming up that you'd like to let everybody know about or a project that you got in the works? Uh, absolutely, man. Yeah. Um, I got a new, um, workout program coming up. It's an eight week workout program. It's the first one I've done. It's called build muscle without weights or the build muscle without weights program. No, I'm not telling people that you don't need to lift weights or that lifting weights are bad or, and, and, and it's not just body weight. It involves bands, stability balls. Um, I, I did this pro program one because certainly because it's unique, not just to be unique, but there's nothing out like that out there, so I wanted to give something that's unique to myself, um, but also to kind of change the stigma about this type of training. That you know, you it's not it's not just stuff that you do when you can't make it to the gym as this secondary thing, or it's not just for beginners. Um, you know, it's not just a fallback, and there's a lot of great protocols in there that you can really um, get some great results and challenge even the most elite, you know, fit athletes. Yeah. So uh, I don't want to get too much into it now. You know, it'll be in the materials when it comes out. But, uh, you know, I, I, I'm i very confident that folks like yourself who really know what they're doing will look at that when they get a chance to see it and go, wow, this is cool stuff. And even if you don't want to follow the program like an individual consumer, I can promise you you're going to want to observe the programming elements and you'll take a lot of protocols out that you can immediately apply with um, some athletes as fitness challenges, as, you know, protocols to put in on your push day and pull day and, Things like that. Well, but uh, I appreciate you sharing all that information and coming on. And, and, you know, as a guy that just appreciates other coaches that are doing their part to try to make the profession better, um, truly appreciate what you do each and every day by, uh, by contributing to that process. So thanks, buddy. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. And, and uh, back, back at you, brother. Keep doing your thing. That's it for this episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk. Thanks to this week's guest as well as our sponsors, EliteForm.com and IgnitionAPG.com for bringing this episode to you for free. Make sure to check out RonMcKeefrey.com where you can join our mailing list, find the show notes, including all the links and resources mentioned, and information about Coach McKeefrey's other products. While you are there, please join Coach McKeefrey in the comments section thanking our guest for sharing. 
If you haven't subscribed to Iron Game Chalk Talk on YouTube or iTunes yet, make sure to do so. Comments, ratings, and reviews are always welcome. Coach McKeefrey can be found on Twitter at rmckeefrey, on Facebook and YouTube at forward slash Ron dot McKeefrey. That's it for this week. Be sure to check back next week for another great episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk.